following quote. While my company and the museum have distinct missions, both are important contributors to our society. The museum in question is the Whitney Museum, a storied cultural institution that contributes to society by exhibiting shows like 2017's An Incomplete History of Protest, which displayed and contextualized protest art. The company in question is Safariland, the U.S.-based manufacturer that contributes to society by producing tear gas and chemical munitions that are used by states to subdue, maim, and kill civilians. The quote equating the Whitney and Safariland's societal contributions is from the CEO Warren B. Canders, who is also the vice chairman of the Whitney Board of Directors. Protesters have demanded his removal for months now, but with the opening of the Whitney Biennial last week, those calls have grown louder than ever. Here to talk about what's at stake is arts and culture journalist Shireen Saad and Whitney Biennial artist Nicholas Galanin. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've described a little bit the issue at hand here, that the uh, vice chairman of the board of the Whitney has a company that has killed civilians. Talk to me a little bit about the protests that have been going on for a while now calling for his removal. Shireen? Yes, it's been several months now since uh, activists, including Decolonize This Place, a very important activist group in New York that has targeted several cultural institutions uh, demanding for the removal of, of certain uh, curators, for example, or, or, or board members or, or donors because of their affiliations with unethical businesses. The, the fact that we're opening a biennial that is very political in substance in terms of the art and the artists that are shown, that is very diverse, that is very progressive, that's very engaged uh, in, in social justice. And on, on the other hand, we have this very unethical practice that's being uh, still supported by the museum as we speak. Nicholas, what were your questions to curators? My questions always are, what's the institution going to do? Um, as artists of color, indigenous artists, uh, in these spaces, you know, I respect... Um, artists that decide not to show at all in them, but also we have to realize that uh, we oftentimes don't have access into these institutions and our voices are generally silenced by history as it is. So to be inside of these institutions and doing the work is equally as important, I believe. Um, and I know there's many ways to go about this engagement, but um, there's not really one answer for that. So, well, and this yeah. biennial has been lauded for its diversity. Um, yeah. A lot of women, a lot of people of color, more than one indigenous person, which must be nice oh, to not this like. Oh, is major. This is not uh, historically, statistically, it's not uh, common at all. Absolutely. Across a lot of these institutions and, and biennials. Sydney 2020 biennial uh, is also re really opened up those gates in, in a good way. So um, we're out here. So Shireen, I imagine for a lot of artists who you've talked to, um, they might have been facing this push-pull that Nicholas describes, where it's like, I have, I'm a young artist. Um, I'm an artist who uh, hasn't had the opportunity to show at an institution like the Whitney. Um, the communities that I'm from have traditionally been underrepresented in mainstream art institutions like this. And so now I have this great invitation. And also, ethically, I find it to be problematic that Warren B. Canders is sitting on the board. Um, one artist actually dropped out. Is that right? Michael Rakovitz did drop out. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the art is being funded, right, by this money. So it's very problematic. But when you really look at it, all cultural institutions are problematic. In fact, all institutions are problematic. So how do you engage with these dynamics as an artist, as a thinker, even as a journalist? You know, how do you really react and contribute to this conversation and, and, and perhaps help shift it? For example, the, the Metropolitan Museum this week announced that they were not uh, taking um, funding from the Sackler uh, family. And the Sackler family, again, uh, the makers of OxyContin, um, who have been indicted in, in federal court. Definitely, and dropped by several other museums. So this is, I think, where part, it's this this moment is is a very important moment in history, in the history of cultural institutions. We're starting to really look not only at the makeup of the artists that are in this space, but also at what you know what's behind the white walls, right? Who's funding um, these walls? How are the, these artists being presented? Are they being tokenized, for example? You know, I think that's a really important question. And so in this case, I think what's really interesting is that several artists actually reacted to the controversy in their work. You also have an uh, artist collective like Forensic Architecture, 
uh, they created a video that is a direct uh, accusation of Safari Land, and um, uh, it shows it shows the use of, of, of non-lethal weapons in several, um, you know, in, in several situations. For example, such as Palestine, where they are being, you know, lethal and, and toxic and, and hurting, harming several people, and so that's a direct accusation, right, of of the donor of the space. Um, so I think this this whole debate is, the tension in the debate itself is interesting. I want to come back to this forensic architecture piece a little bit later, but maybe, Nicholas, you could tell us a little bit about your piece in the show, which is called White Noise American Prayer Rug. White Noise American Prayer Rug is uh, conversations surrounding the current climate that we are in right now politically, um, historically. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe it physically for people who may not sure. be able to get out sure it's to see it? it's a uh, it's a uh, 7 by 9 foot i believe is the dimensions <clears throat> um hand um not tied rug that was that was created in pakistan uh, i work with artists out there and use traditional techniques and materials um and the imagery on the rug is of a TV screen. I know it's a generational conversation now, an analog TV, but when there's no signal, you get the white noise. And the white noise is also uh, something that a dro droning sound or tone that can is sometimes used to obliterate other sounds. So it's a reference to how uh, the idea of whiteness, um, a fabricated idea of whiteness, even. Uh, consumes cultures and communities, consumes our stories, consumes our histories, our bodies, our land, um, our objects. The disconnect of having no signal and means of communication is also part of this conversation, which is uh, embedded in the imagery of the work. The xenophobia that is uh, thrown around, um, not only in our community, in our country, in these lands, but also that affects other communities abroad, reflected in um, the recent New Zealand atrocity. Mm -hmm. These things have cause and effect in our communities. And, 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 and it, this ties into the conversation of Candor's. This ties into the conversation of the museum. So it seems that obviously uh, the political climate is informing the work that you do. Always. And this, this conversation at the Whitney is um, not new to indigenous communities in, in our it, it's tied into colonialism it's tied into uh, the settler state that we live in in these places where our communities have been divided by borders that were not here um, it's tied into the violence that happens in these spaces so all of these conversations tie into this conversation at the Whitney coming back to the forensic architecture piece so my understanding is that when the biennial comes calling, sometimes people already have maybe a piece of work that they want to expand on, and sometimes they have to create something that has, doesn't exist yet. Um, and it sounds like forensic architecture used this invitation as a jumping off point to create the piece that they showed at the biennial. Is that right? It seems that it was a direct you know, reaction to, uh, to, the, uh, to the moment. Right. They've always been engaged in, in regional politics. And I think for them, there's no other way uh, but to engage directly with any sort of political issue at stake. And my understanding is that it's an 11-minute video narrated by David Byrne. Laura Poitras was also involved in some way. And it outlines the case against Safariland and Warren Bikanders in excruciating detail using data and evidence about the ways in which the products that they create are used to kill and maim civilians. That piece was really striking. It was very powerful. Unfortunately, it's tucked away in the black room, so you don't see it unless you know it's there. You know, I had to look for it and ask for it. Um, however, I think it's very interesting that it's that it's there um, inside the museum, where you know that is you know uh, attacking the the person who has funded the space. Did the curators know? about this project in advance? Did did forensic architecture give them warning, hey, we're gonna make an inflammatory piece criticizing the Whitney? So my understanding is that the curators knew that a lot of the work was going to react uh, directly to these urgent issues in society and to the Candorous controversy. Uh, but I think the policy is to, to give artists um, you know, freedom to express themselves. 
So, Nicholas, you signed a petition, correct? The, the Verso letter. Right, the Verso letter. Um, talk to me a little bit about your decision to sign this. It's not without risks. I don't think it was a tough decision at all. What does it call for? Does it call for Canada's remov removal? Yes. Um, when you look at cultural institutions, I'm thinking of MoMA. I'm thinking of, um, you know, the Koch brothers' support of the ballet. When you look at the boards and the people who attend the galas, it's like a who's who list of the most evil white men in the world, right? All of the money, a lot of the money that our most esteemed cultural institutions are built with mm -hmm. comes from nefarious means. The problem is institutional. It's a structural problem, right? Because it starts, everything's about money. So if you don't have money as an artist, you can't have a studio, you can't travel, you can't show your work to curators, you can't, and so on and so forth. And so it's the same with, as you said, you know, institutional funding, right? You can't really be on a board if you don't have the means to support. I mean, millions of, we're talking about millions of dollars, right? Who has millions of dollars? So I think there's, there's a project of obviously changing the conversation and the narrative, which we're doing. And then the deeper project of, of shifting the means of the economic means and giving more power to other people so that they can have a say as well. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. And it's a very complicated, uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, right? If we start eliminating funders whose money comes from evil means, who is left? Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do that. So I spoke with uh, the leadership at the museum and they told me that they were taking this question very seriously, that they were having internal conversations about how to react. They didn't want to um, act too fast, I guess, for obvious reasons. Uh, but it, it, I think it is still a shock that, you know, as the biennial opens, we still don't have an answer. I'm happy to see that this is happening around one of the most lauded events in the art world. Everybody can have a role in, in change and uh, I think we have to, we have no choice. My relationship to especially institutions and museums um, as an indigenous artist has always been, it's always been a problematic and political relationship for our communities, all museums. I went to these institutions across the world to research my community and my culture and our objects that were stolen from graves, that were removed from our communities in the process of genocide of our people and our lands, removing our language, removing our objects, literally our bones, which still exist in some of the basements of these spaces. So I have to visit and tour and walk through these halls and go to the basements to, to uh, gain uh, connection and understanding to ceremonial objects that have been removed from our, these spaces. So the Whitney's conversation is another facet in this, this uh, building of these institutions, literally even the land these institutions are built on. So, so there's it, there's a lot of layers that connect all the way back to um, co colonialism and the colonization of America. So. Absolutely. Well, Nicholas, congratulations um, on your pieces in the show. I'm so glad that your voice is included in the show and the voice of other members of Indigenous communities, women, other underrepresented. Um, communities as well. Uh, and Shireen, thank you so much for joining us and filling us in on, on this important story. Thank you so much. Thank you.